Welcome to another bonus episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey there, this uh, is the last time we are going to be talking paranormal activity movies on this here uh, bonus episode of The Dark Parade, and lesson they make another one. But yeah, we so we started with strangely next of kin was one of the first movies we ever talked about on on uh, this year found footage fool stuff, and uh, since then, uh, really starting around November when the kids decided that they wanted to watch Paranormal Activity, which turned out to be a terrible, terrible idea, uh, it affected them negatively in a number of ways, um, as it has the culture at large, really. Um, and now that we look at some of these sequels, but yeah, I've been working my way through the series again, uh, slowly, but surely, you know, it took a, a couple of months to kind of get through them all. Um, but now we have with this episode done every single one. So we're today we're talking about, uh, paranormal activity, the marked ones, which is paranormal, paranormal activity five. We're going to be doing The Ghost Dimension, which is Paranormal Activity 6. And as a special side bonus something or other, we're going to talk about Paranormal Activity Tokyo Night, also known as Paranormal Activity 2 Tokyo Night, uh, which is an all-Japanese version of this, right? So Paranormal Activity 5 diverges from the series. Like when when last we left this series, Katie and, uh, and her coven of witches had stolen uh, both Hunter, uh, who was living with an adopted family, and another kid that just came from somewhere. I'm still kind of unclear on where the kid that Katie had came from. Uh, but at any rate, um, that and then all the rest of that family, other than the girl who was like away at vacation or something, uh, was dead. So, you know, she'll be in therapy the rest of her life, I'm sure. Um, and so Paranormal Activity 5, it does continue the paranormal activity story, but it does it with new characters, which is, I'm kind of grateful for, you know, I have a, a pet theory about all of these that the only good paranormal activities are, are the odd numbered ones. It's the, you know, reverse star Trek theory where one is good. Paranormal activity. One is really good. Paranormal activity. Three uh, is pretty fun. You know, the one with the, the parents and that kind of thing. And I think I just like that oscillating fan gag that works for me and I, I think it's kind of creepy and then five um and which is the the marked ones and we'll talk more about that in a minute and i think that's kind of it i think there are three good paranormal activity movies and there's a lot of lore but as i was saying the what what makes the marked ones kind of interesting it's written and directed by christopher landon who did you know freaky and uh, uh the happy death day to you and that kind of thing so um, it is, you know, a little off the beaten path for this series, which is good because the, the rest of the series had grown really tired. And with the marked ones, you're going into like a Hispanic neighborhood and a Hispanic family. Um, there's a young kid, uh, by the, the name of Jesse, uh, his buddy Hector, they've got their friend Marisol and then um, they've got like a creepy downstairs neighbor, right? That's kind of the, the premise of this is there's this creepy downstairs neighbor who dies and they start investigating her house and then uh, discover that there is devilish stuff afoot in, in said house. And more than that, there, there appears to be a fixation on Jesse, that Jesse is somehow um, uh, part of this. And anyway, we get... Uh, into Jesse being this like vessel for possession and he starts doing possessed people stuff. There's, there's a moment in it. I really like, and I, I might mention this later and apologies if I do, but there, there's a great moment where Jesse kind of disappears. And as they're recording this, uh, he just pops back into existence, but the world kind of wobbles before he does it's really good. It's a really good effect. And I also like the fact that at this point in the paranormal activity, activity series, they're throwing away all pretense of this might be a real thing. This is just all paranormal activity nonsense, right? 
So, uh, obviously, when we talk about these movies, we have a, a very uh, specific set of criteria that we use to evaluate whether these movies are good or bad. Uh, and that is our found footage tropes. We have a, a five tropes that we are going to examine to determine if this is, in fact, a good found footage movie. Um, so let's start with number one, which is keeping the camera on. And at first, it's sort of Jesse's obsession. You know, he he sees a camera being used, and he kind of gets into it, and he uses some of his graduation money to buy this camera. And so he's filming everything. And that holds up till about the middle of the movie, where suddenly people are popping into and out of existence and you know later in the movie assaulting covens of witches on their property and so forth uh so it's about half effective but also i i'm a bit forgiving of that um mostly because it's it, it's just so silly at a certain point right like or it's just going for something grander and just using that as um, as a trope, as a, as a means to tell the story, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense all the time. But when you have, you know, characters popping in from an alternate dimension, perhaps whether or not the camera is kept on is, is not the greatest concern. Um, so let's talk about the characters. And, and this is another place where Paranormal Activity, the marked ones, is superior to some of the other sequels. I think Jesse starts off as interesting. He kind of becomes a like evil superhero later in the movie in a way that again is is a little silly, but I think maybe it's the silliness of this movie that I like. It, there there's an element of camp to it whether intended or not. It feels like it is a campier version of this story, and I I kind of do like that. Uh so Jesse um, in addition to being a possessed superhero, at first he, he seems like a really nice guy and his buddy Hector is kind of the comic relief of the movie and, and also sort of the guy carrying the camera at a certain point. And Hector is, is an interesting character. Marisol feels a little tacked on. She doesn't do a ton in the movie. She is mostly there just to round out the cast, I think. Uh, the, the woman playing the grandmother, though, is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, who's like, hey, you guys are dealing with devil shit and you need to knock it off. Uh, that, that's a real good time. And, yeah, so, the, you know, the characters are likable to passing. Um, and, and they're fine, right? Which brings us to number three, which is authenticity. Does Paranormal Activity, the marked ones, feel authentic? Um, and that's kind of a no, but that's not a bad thing in this case I, because I think of the tone, right? But is it authentic? No, because of what we talked about with like at a certain point, it doesn't make sense to keep the camera on for some of these shenanigans. Um, you know, some of this is clearly uh, set up to, to be for the audience's benefit as opposed to something that would be a natural extension of the character's behavior. Um, but it's, again, I, I don't want to say that that's bad. Uh, it, it just is inauthentic. It, it like, this feels like you're watching a movie. Uh, it does not feel as though this is, you know, footage found and, and uh, compiled by an editor to, to, uh, tell the story. This definitely feels like Chris Landon was making a movie. This was not intended to fool anybody <laughs> that this was real. Um, and, and it, it bends that trope to the point of breaking a couple of times. So I would say it's inauthentic. And I know I said in the upfront that I like this movie. And now I'm saying like, well, the characters are okay to passable. It's not authentic. The reasons for keeping the camera on, uh, are, are suspect, uh, at times. And that brings us to the watchability though. And this is really, sort of the double jeopardy category where the totals really add up despite all of the flaws of the above or the fact that this doesn't fit neatly into the, the traditional found footage movie that we normally talk about on the show and, and feels a little more Hollywood, a little more like made up uh, for the lack of a better term. Um, the watchability is real high with this one. 
because it kind of keeps moving. Like you go from introducing the characters to, Hey, there's this creepy lady downstairs to, Oh, this creepy lady died. Let's go into her place. Oh, her place is kind of jacked up. Um, Oh, it turns out that, you know, she was part of this coven of witches. Oh, it further turns out that there's a bunch of these covens of witches known as the midwives and they are all over the place and they are recruiting according to Chris Landon. <laughs> Although this seems to be sidelined later in uh, the next movie we'll, we'll talk about, but they're recruiting like this army of young men who are turning 18 who have been marked to be, you know, vessels of evil um, hence the, the marked ones title. And that leads to, you know, the friends kind of tracking Jesse down when he goes missing because like, Hey, once Jesse is fully missing, uh, you know, the, the coven has him and they will perform a ritual. And as, uh, this, you know, expository character says, once that happens, Jesse will look like Jesse, but it will not be Jesse anymore. And that leads to them tracking him down and doing an assault uh, on this coven of witches at their place of covening, covening perhaps, and with some gangbangers who are also, you know, like are, one of them had a brother that was sort of shanghai by these witches too. And so it's a bunch of dudes showing up with shotguns, blasting witches who are screaming and coming at them. And that is far and away the best part of this movie because what Christopher Landon does wisely, I would say, is that when these witches get shot, they go flying backwards like it's a Chuck Norris movie or something. It is fantastic. And maybe that's why I like the March one so much. I like the March ones because it has a real pace and knows where it's headed and what it's doing. And uh, the end is maybe a letdown because you end up in a place in the movie where you're tying this all back into the original films. And although this comes into play a little bit in part six, where you can go through doors that lead you to different places in time and space. Uh, so for example, Hector, as he's running around and hiding from witches and a freshly possessed and, and supercharged Jesse, he goes through a door where um, he ends up in Katie and Mika's house and is there the last night. Like, presumably, he is there in the last moments of the original Paranormal Activity movie and ends up getting killed by a witch in in the, uh, the kitchen there. But you hear some of the stuff from that the original movie and you see Katie kind of walking through in her you know I'm possessed zombie way and yeah so uh, I don't know that it in like the, the taste that it leaves in your mouth at the end of the movie to kind of tie it back in with the rest of the series isn't my favorite but I have a good time with part five uh, I don't think it's great uh, you know, I don't think it's genuinely uh, frightening the way that Paranormal Activity 1 is, but I think it's fun, which kind of brings us to the fifth criteria, right, which is is the scares part of it. And it's not scary. It is more of a popcorn horror movie. And, and that's kind of what Christopher Landon does best, is he's not necessarily great at scaring an audience, but he's pretty good at entertaining an audience. And, and that's why I think that part five, if I were, you know, given a, a five star scale, um, I, you know, three stars, three and a half, like it's, it's right on the verge of being kind of mid as the kids say. Um, but it's not, it's like, it's not terrible and it's occasionally pretty good and pretty engaging and visually interesting and seeing Jesse pop into existence like, you know, the, the father in Evil Dead 2 or something, uh, or uh, gangbangers killing witches with shotguns. Like, that should have been the movie, quite frankly. You, co you, you call a movie witches versus gangbangers, and I'm there. I want to see that movie. So it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, not great, but pretty good. So, um, you know, again, 135. I, I think all of those have something to recommend them more so one in five. I think 
three is the one that's really on the bubble. And if I thought about it a little more, I would probably say it's not as good um, as one or five. And I think that's true. I, I think three is is passable to okay. And I think maybe five is a little more leaning into like, this is very silly at times, but it's at least entertaining in its silliness. Um, which brings us to part six, which was until next of Ken, uh, which is a very different movie until next of Ken. It was the last of the paranormal activity movies. And you know, they, they got away from calling these things like paranormal activity five, the marked ones and paranormal activity six, the ghost dimension. They just call it the ghost dimension, but who are we kidding? Right. This is paranormal activity six, the ghost dimension. So, this is a family that has moved in to the paranormal activity house. Uh, the one, not, not the original one, but the one of Katie's sister with, you know, those kids. Right. And they end up the, by the way, just for references sake, this was directed by a guy named Gregory Plotkin who also did Hellfest, uh, edited Hellfest, uh, edited Happy Death Day. So I wonder if there's not, you know, sort of a crossover with him and Chris Landon. I wonder if they met on the uh, Paranormal Activity series. But um, but directed this, directed um, a short called Black Mass, directed Hellfest, and directed a movie called Crimson, which I haven't seen, which also seems like a a horror film uh that where creepy clowns are living next door to a guy anyway doesn't matter that feels like something i need to see uh probably not a great idea but i feel like i still need to see it anyway and then written by jason pagan android duchman adam robitel and gavin heffernan so a lot of writers on this thing and it kind of feels like two movies really there is the story of this family who moves into, um, you know, the, the house that was the ground zero for demonic happenings. And it's uh, a guy named Ryan, his wife, Layla, I think is her name, or maybe that's the kid. I think that's the kid. Who is his wife? It doesn't matter. Anyway, he's got a wife. And then there's uh, what seemingly is an au pair named Emily. And then they're like Ryan's brother, Mike is staying with them. Just, you know, kind of washed up on the shores of their house. And what they realize when going through the garage one day is that the previous owners have left this camera that is unlike any camera that Ryan can find anywhere else on the net because it's got all these lenses that it's pushing the image through and it looks uh, a little odd and also when you are recording with it or looking through it you can see stuff that initially they think well this is just a weird thing with the camera um but it turns out of course that what they are seeing is the ghosts and demons and stuff what and whatnot of the house And that was the tagline of this, right? Was that, you know, this time uh, you get to see the the paranormal uh, paranormal activity. Uh, For the first time you will see the activity is is what's at the top of the poster. And that's kind of true. It's a lot of CGI mess, but that's kind of true. And so anyway, it's what you would expect of this movie is they start recording stuff around the house and then activity gets heightened. Uh, you know, people start being attacked. They call in a priest who's like, Oh, this is some serious shit. Like your daughter has been targeted by this ghost. The, the daughter, I think the daughter is Layla. That sounds right. And, um, you know, it's, it's the same old story, right? An entity that calls itself Toby, um, who wants to, you know, use the daughter. And, So we get a little more story of the midwives, which in this case, they are not raising an army of 18 year old possessed superheroes. In this case, they are using children to create a bodily vessel for Toby, 
for this demon who can then go out and wreak havoc, I guess. And, you know, here's one of the big problems with the movie is that it was in 3D and the movie plays to that for getting that, hey, if you are not watching this in 3D, let's just say 3D is kind of a fad that comes and goes. And so when it goes and your movie depends very heavily on the 3D gags in the movie, it's perhaps less effective. Especially towards the end when it when it's getting, you know, kind of crazy. Um, that's where that stuff is, is most apparent and most apparently bad. Um, but okay, so that's the, the pretty much the story. And there, there's a door that opens up in the girl's bedroom and it allows her to kind of go back and forth in time. Um, they also find some videotapes of uh, Katie and Christy when they were kids that seem to be reacting to them in the present, the the people watching it in the present to suggest that, you know, Christy has some gift of foresight um, of, of prediction and that the little girl is kind of traveling back through this door into the past where Katie and Christy are still young girls. And I don't know why other than, Hey, we want to tie this back into the original story in the Katie and Christie stuff. Uh, because other than it being a thing in the movie that there is this weird time travel happening, it's not critical to the plot. And, and it still leaves me with, with questions about like why and feel free by the way, to hop over on the discord and explain to me the ins and outs, like the mythology of these paranormal, paranormal activity movies is a mess. So if someone can succinctly explain, here is the story of the Paranormal Activity series, other than there are two sisters, Katie and Christy, who are targeted by a demon because of a deal that was made by an ancestor waiting for a male heir. And then the the male heir shows up and is taken by Katie. But then that's kind of dropped. And then instead it's to give Toby a body with which to wreak havoc. And so other girls are brought back in time to hang out with Katie and Christy who are also used in this ritual, I think is what's happening. Uh, so anyway, you tell me by all means, you know, again, drop a line in the discord. You can go to legionpodcast.com, go to the shows, go to, uh, the dark parade. And there you will find links to the discord server, etc. Uh, and you let me know, please. I would love to know what is going on in this movie um, beyond the basics. Like I, I still don't understand how this totally fits in with everything else that happened in the series up to now, but doesn't matter. So let's get to keeping the camera on. Um, this is pretty good, better than part five. And that's one of the few times you'll hear me say part six is better than part five. But the reason it is better than, than part five in this respect is that you know, it's, hey, they got this super camera that is being used to record paranormal happenings. And so it makes sense to be using this camera as well as some other cameras that they set up. Because once they realize that the girl is targeted, they're kind of watching the house from all angles to, to try to, you know, document this and prevent it. But this is also the thing. I, I saw somebody mention, like, you know, with a world in which there are cable channels where ghost hunters are running around trying to find proof of the supernatural. You get one night's worth of taping in this house and you are set for life. Like you have every scientist in the world in your house because of what you are capturing on tape. Uh, but at any rate, so keeping the camera on totally makes sense for this movie. Then you have, um, the characters, right? Like are the characters interesting? Um, I do kind of like the husband and his brother in this, although, you know, by the time you get to the, hey, everybody is running around uh, business, then there's not that much there. Um, you know, they, there's just not much relationship. Um, there is some business with like my uncle Mike and uh, Emily, the au pair as to maybe having a burgeoning relationship. But again, none of that is explored too much. It's, you know, one of the problems with having four writers on your movie is that a lot of this stuff is messy and gets dropped and doesn't really go anywhere. 
and this is one of those things that doesn't really go anywhere. Um, you know, the, the kid's not very likable and that's a problem when you're supposed to be, you know, rooting for the parents to save this girl. And you're like, eh, you know, you're both young. You could still have another child. Maybe the next one will be better. Um, then, uh, let's do authenticity. It does this feel real. Of course not. Like with all the 3d gimmicks and the, you know, the, like what makes paranormal, paranormal activity work is the sparseness of it. And what makes paranormal activity six not work is that it's really overblown. You do see a lot more, you know, you see this kind of dark ropey ghost like entity moving around and at times that's kind of cool, but it also is a big CGI bleh, and that only goes so far. Um, it's not a particularly frightening image and, but because you're doing all the CGI stuff and that kind of thing, it's again, it's like, well, this is obviously not authentic because I get like see above regarding every scientist in the world beating down their door to try to capture some of this on tape the way that they have. So it doesn't feel real in any way. And that brings us to watchability. Is this movie watchable? And is it watchable? Eh, sure. You know, <laughs> can, can you watch this as a movie uh, comprised of 24 frames a second that are played sequentially in a way that makes it look like moving images? Yes. Um, is it very effective? No, it, it feels like there, there are things that are interesting about like the, the super ghost camera is kind of a fun idea. It feels very William Castle in a way, you know, uh, kind of uh, 13 ghosts ish. Um, and I think it might've been better if you just leaned into it fully and did the thing of like, Oh, put on your glasses now when the ghosts are coming or something, uh, that might've been fun. But instead, it, it leans into the 3D in a way that doesn't play very well now. It doesn't develop the mythology in a way that feels coherent with what came before. So I don't know that it's a particularly effective paranormal activity sequel in that way, even though it does refer to Katie and Christy and you see them as children in the movie on tape and, and later, you know, in the flesh. Um, and you kind of get a resolution, I suppose, of, of Toby becoming a real boy like Pinocchio. Tonocchio, Toby Nocchio, something. There's something there. But other than that, it's, it's kind of a whole lot of nothing. And I just got bored. You know, that's the biggest sin that you can make in these movies is they're not they're like they're so pared down that you need it to have a, a sense of, of urgency, of vibration, of movement. And Paranormal Activity 6 never quite gets there. Like the, like I said, with Paranormal Activity 5, that is a movie that's always moving forward in some way. This is a movie that kind of sits with the premise until the very end. And then everything explodes there. But by then, like you just don't care. It's just not not all that fun to see CGI blobs flit in front of the camera and see people chase that around. It's just not, it's not a good time. So, you know, it's pretty bad in terms of watchability. It's pretty dull. The effects don't hold up. The 3d gags don't hold up. The characters aren't really that interesting. Um, yeah, it, it's a bit of a bummer. And then we get to scares, right? This is the, the part that, um, you know, is, is most important, right? Like, hey, if there are a handful of good scares, that would also increase the watchability. And there's not. There's nothing scary about this movie. It is. There are some jump scares in it, but none of them are very good. They're incredibly telegraphed. And, and there's nothing creative about any of them. It's just the, the exact stuff that you expect. Um, and then once you get to, you know, Hey, we've, we've caught Toby on tape and Toby's doing his demonic possession stuff and is at one point hiding on the other side of a kitchen Island from our heroes. And then kind of doesn't do much. It's just not very good. Like the best sequence is when they're performing 
not an exorcism. Uh, what is the the priest called? Like a uh, an extraction, I think, is what he calls it. When you know they're throwing um, a sheet over this ghost that's lying uh, in in the middle of this pentagram where they've trapped it, and that part of it is kind of fun. But there's like two minutes of that maybe in this ninety minute movie, and and otherwise it it just devolves into kind of nonsense and and that part isn't scary, but it's at least something that happens. That's kind of interesting to look at. Um, and you know, if you're doing away with the premise that this is real, you know, you, you can lean into the unrealness of it in the way that part five does, or you can try to get back a little of the mojo of the first one and go bare bones again. But this tries to do both of those things of let's go back to the, you know, often static cameras of the original, but also do all of this over the top kind of silly stuff. And those two things don't sit well together that if you're going to do a bare bones, do a bare bones. If you want to go over the top, go over the top. Don't try to do both of those things at the same time. And that's kind of what, uh, ghost dimension wants and you know it's the having its cake and eating its two thing and it just doesn't work very well so yeah it's not uh, the watchability is real low it's not scary this is one of the worst sequels really because it is so disappointing especially because it's the last one and they're trying to wrap some stuff up i i suppose uh it's just not good at all and you know i think when i rated it, it was about like one and a half stars out of five um it just doesn't have a lot to recommend it. And I would honestly say like, just stop with part five. Part five is good. You know, it's a, it's a fun watch. You, you can ignore the rest of, uh, the, the ones that came after even next of Ken is real middling. Although the end of next of Ken, I like, um, okay. But as a bonus, as a special bonus to you for having, um, gone through all of this paranormal activity business with me, let us talk about 2010's Paranormal Activity Tokyo Night, which was a Japanese sequel to the original uh, Paranormal Activity. It came out in 2010, directed and written by Toshikazu Nage. He has done, you know, movies, a, a series of movies called Banned from Broadcast that I am not really familiar with. Done a lot of television work. Uh, did videos like, called Scary Nursery Rhymes 1 and 2, which I also haven't seen. A movie called Hora no Tenshi that feels like something I should watch. But he wrote and directed a lot of his own stuff, including Paranormal Activity 2, Tokyo Night. And let me see if I can pronounce the original uh, title of this. Paranomaru Akutibiti Dai Tusho Tokyo Night. That is as close as we're going to get without repeated practice when that seems, you know, silly. So, um, it stars, uh, Ayu Nakamura as Koichi, who is the brother who is doing all the filming, uh, Noriko Aoyama as Haruka, um, who was in a movie called Legendary Assassin as well as this, uh, and is it apparently there is a Japanese series called CSI Crime Scene Talks that she was on. Uh, done a lot of television. Oh my goodness. Homicide Team 9, Tokyo MPD, uh, How to Eliminate My Teacher. Sounds pretty fun. Anyway. Um, and then there's the, the, the father and so forth. But anyway, the, the premise of it is... Haruka has come back from America and ever since coming back from America where she was in a car accident and busted both of her legs, like fractured both of her, her lower leg bones, uh, her shins. And so she is, you know, in a wheelchair and, um, is staying with her brother Koichi while their dad is off doing business stuff as dads tend to do. Uh, paranormal stuff starts happening around the house. Koichi convinces her to start recording this. Again, this is a very paranormal activity, right? Like, we're not doing anything too fancy with it. We're not getting ghost dimension with this. Um, and so he convinces her to start 
setting up cameras in her bedroom to record some of the stuff that they're seeing, which starts innocently enough with he puts some salt by the suitcase she brought back from America and it, you know, spills away from the suitcase at one point. And then, you know, doors start opening and closing and then her uh, sheets start getting pulled off her bed her wheelchair starts moving around on its own glasses start shattering that kind of thing and much like the original paranormal activity it never goes totally over the top uh, until the end and so I'm going to spoil uh, paranormal activity 2 Tokyo Night uh, which is kind of hard to find like you're not going to find it on any of the streaming services uh, it was it took a little bit of digging uh, to find not a, a ton it's out there like if you if you do enough googling you can find a copy of it to watch online um, and would I recommend doing that well let's get into it um, so criteria number one for this bonus found footage fool uh, for Tokyo night yes it makes a, a lot of sense because Koichi is trying to capture what's going on in the house and then when things really go off um you can argue he should have just put the camera down to run uh but there's also a little security camera footage that offsets some of that of like well obviously at the end of the movie when he is in a morgue identifying his father probably not going to be holding a camera so we're using security camera footage from uh the morgue um for the most part yeah there are a couple of moments that are strained credulity, but it's not terrible in that respect. And then there are characters. Um, you know, I think they're pretty fun. Koichi is real gung ho about capturing all this footage. Um, Haruka is at first reticent, but then later on she reveals like this actually started happening to me after I hit this crazy woman, what killed her boyfriend. And in the, the, canon of Tokyo Night Katie is killed by this car when Haruka and you know strikes her on her way to the airport or whatever where she breaks her legs and so Katie for the purposes of this offshoot of paranormal activity Katie is dead and this demon has attached itself to Haruka during that process but yeah so she's initially reticent to say that hey weird stuff has been happening since I was in America and it just has continued since I've been here and then by the time she's willing to talk about it you know we're in the full stages of her going into Koichi's bedroom standing over him you know showing up listless outside screaming that kind of stuff um, but they're not bad characters you know they're they're suitable for this kind of movie then we get to authenticity does this feel believable um, aside from my, you know, picadillos with when the camera maybe should have been turned off um, during some of the ending moments of this movie. Um, yeah, fairly, fairly authentic. Um, my favorite sequence is actually when some of their friends come over and are kind of trading the camera around. And one of them is sort of spiritually sensitive and has a good old fashioned freak out. And it's like, I got to get out of here. There is something really rotten in Denmark and I got to leave this place. So that, that part of it was really fun. Um, those characters were some of the most fun in the movie, but they're only in it briefly, but Koichi and, and Haruka are good enough to carry the movie through for the most part. Then we get to the authenticity part of it. Does it all feel authentic? Um, yeah, and it does a good, a really good job of, again, because it's low stakes, right? Like the original Paranormal Activity, where nothing totally bananas is happening. You know, as crazy as Paranormal Activity gets before the ending is like the Ouija board catching fire. And there's a scene like that in this movie. Uh, not quite the same, but that involves a, a crucifix moving around on the floor and uh, eventually uh, catching fire, I believe. And the, so there's some of that, like this movie definitely borrows some pages from the book of the original paranormal activity, which is fine. It's, you know, it is a, one of those sequels that rather than explode the story is just like, Hey, what if we do that again? Uh, only in a different place. 
and that's kind of Tokyo Night. Um, but it does feel like this is legitimately footage, and I like the inclusion of that uh, security camera footage at the end to add a little bit of authenticity to it. Um, and then watchability. Is it a watchable movie? And yeah, it is. Um, it's pretty fun. It's very, very similar to Paranormal Activity. Like I said, it's very much the in the stripe of what if we did this movie only in Japan and we did it you know, in a different geographical location, but the beats are largely the same. Um, it does make it different that the dynamic is between brother and sister as opposed to husband and wife. That's more fun. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a good paranormal activity movie. Um, is it a great par- paranormal activity movie? Not great. It's good. Uh, it, I had a good time with it. Like I said, that when some other characters show up, it gives it some much needed life. And there's one scene in particular, let, let's jump to the fifth criteria, which is scares. And that is really where I think the movie kind of shines. Like, and most of it is fairly mundane until it gets to the end. There's a, a great moment at the end of the movie where once Haruka is straight possessed, she gets out of bed on her legs both still in casts and you can kind of hear the bones grinding as she's trying to walk like the first time she is unsuccessful and then is puppeted out of bed by the the demon again and that is the point where it's like oh well this is unpleasant to watch but also kind of great and that leads to like the koichi fleeing and the scene in the morgue is pretty good and so it's it's not terrifying but there's some good creepy uncomfortable stuff in the last 20 to 30 minutes and that's backloading it to be sure like i think paranormal activity is more creepy throughout but because you've seen paranormal activity when you see this happen in paranormal activity too you're like right 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 the door opens, the door closes, we hear the the sound. The next day they're going to talk about this. Right, right, right. Uh, so it doesn't feel like it's doing its own thing until the end of the movie. But once it starts doing its own thing, it leans much more into that J-horror kind of, you know, Haruka is wandering around with this weird gait because of her broken legs and her hair down in front of her face um, in a very you know, ring kind of way and a grudge kind of way. It, it bends paranormal activity into a J horror movie at the end. And that's the part of it. I liked. And I do think it's, it's genuinely creepy at that point. And it's probably the most interesting thing about the movie is to see how a Japanese director wraps that movie into Japanese culture and Japanese ghost tropes and so forth. And it kind of totally gets there at the end. Like, um, it does feel like a J horror movie in the last few minutes. So I, you know, it's tough to recommend. Like I would probably give this a real middling, like two and a half stars out of five. That may have been in fact what I scored it, but maybe I might've gone as high as three when I originally scored it on Letterboxd. But, uh, it, it's totally because of the end of the movie. It's, it's totally because I love Japanese horror films and it becomes a J-horror movie in in the last act. Um, so your mileage may vary. If, if that is not your bag, then it is going to feel very atonal when it makes that shift. But I was kind of hoping it would make that shift and then it did. Um, okay, so there you have it. There are the final three Paranormal Activity movies. To the best of my knowledge, we have now talked about everything paranormal activity with the exception of, I think there's a, a, a BR video game in the paranormal activity universe. And I haven't bothered with that. Although I might, I might, let me, I might see if we can do that as a live stream or something, but um, we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, so in the meantime, thank you as always for joining uh, me here to talk about found footage movies. Uh, we'll get back to some, non-standard non-paranormal activity found footage movie soon get into some other nonsense uh the next week 
maybe if I can get it all organized, maybe the much talked about return of Richard Glenn Schmidt as we talk about bloody muscle bodybuilder from hell. If I may have that title wrong, but that's the next movie I want to do as a, a standalone kind of episode about a movie with a guest. Uh, even though we haven't had a guest in a long time and you know, other than on the bonus stuff, uh, which is my own fault for, you know, going to school all the time and dealing with kids and whatnot. So, uh, but that is the plan that is, I plan on, on trying to get that recorded very soon. So that will be the last episode of January as of the time of this recording. Uh, if that does not work out, if Richard is busy, then we'll come up with something else. So, um, that'll do it this time. Uh, by all means, uh, as I mentioned before, go to legionpodcast.com. You can find a link over to the, uh, the discord server there. That is where I am, uh, most active, but you can also find links to like the Facebook group. Uh, I don't really mess with Twitter much these days, although there is a, a Twitter account and I don't know where, where should we be? You tell me hop over to discord or drop me a line at, uh, you can actually you can email me directly at bo b o dot ransdell r a n s d e l l at gmail dot com if you've got any questions. You can also do the same at bo b o at legionpodcasts dot com. Uh, but either of those ways, you want to get in touch with me, drop me a line. Let me know what you want to see or hear uh, here on the show. Um, we are talking. Uh, Jamie and Duncan and I are talking about another game night, uh, like we did with the trivia thing. Um, so that is forthcoming. We're not sure what form that is going to take yet, but we are going to try something soon. Um, and I think that's going to do it this time. So I hope you're well, I hope 2023 is treating you right so far. And, uh, I know for my, my part, other than having to wait forever for a damn test score so I can get my teaching job, uh, I'm, I've been doing really well and, and I'm excited about what the, the year brings. This should be a really good year. I think I'm very excited about it. And I say that, and then, you know, I'll walk the dog today and break my leg in four places. That's just how the universe works. Sometimes kids, I don't know if you knew that sometimes you say things are going to be great. And then the world just comes up, bites you in the ass to remind you that that all is beyond your control. Sometimes weird stuff just happens, but, uh, but take care of yourselves out there. Uh, and as always, thank you for, uh, joining me on the dark parade. We'll see you next time.